Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. So, welcome to part two, Kate. This is where the questions get a lot longer because we try to pretend we're more clever than we actually are. <laughs> uh, so, forgive me for the length of this first question, which is coming your way because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and obviously, just for our listeners as well, again, this is could be a potentially difficult topic to kind of get your head around. So, let's just jump straight in. In one of the starkest chapters of Entitled, you talk about the entitlement to medical care. Uh, you include some shocking examples of how women are harmed by male entitlement to medical care. So, for example, uh, women racialized as black in the United States are three to four times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy or childbirth than their white counterparts. You say, and I'm quoting you here, women compared to men receive less and less effective pain relief, less pain medication with opioids and more antidepressants and get more mental health referrals. A major finding is that women's pain in the reviews, reviews studied uh, was psychologized. Women's pain reports are taken less seriously. The pain is discounted as being psychotic or non-existent. And the medication is less than adequate for the treatment given compared to men. This refers to the stereotype that boys and men are more stoical than women and girls when it comes to pain. That they will, quote, man up and, quote, deal with it. And that women and girls exaggerate pain or are simply hysterical. How deeply rooted do you think this problem is? Uh, is it possible that you know female doctors and female nurses are also participating in these patriarchal structures and neglecting women and girls? Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I think those kinds of biases are very deeply rooted. And mm. I mean, this is a, so a lot of these studies, they're naturalistic. So they're looking at what happens in the field and it's often difficult to um, disaggregate by the by the, the sex of the doctor without other factors being introduced. But what I will say is that I think a lot of the biases that I'm trying to call out in all of this work, at least when it comes to the experimental findings, it's mm. really mm. striking how rarely the sex of participants make a difference. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit speculative when it comes to the issue of women's pain and medical issues specifically, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if this is something that women as doctors also perpetuate if we can extrapolate from other kinds of studies where the same biases show up equally in men and women. Um, mm. And often, I should also say, we don't always have data about non-binary people. Um, mm. But again, it wouldn't be surprising if we've all imbibed this kind of um, bias that leads us to take women less seriously, even if mm. we're women ourselves or our gender non-conforming or non-binary or what have you. So something which perhaps we should have uh, asked you about in the first section, which you really bring into this book, is that this social order, this great chain of being, is not just male and female, but also includes discrimination based on race and, mm. and other factors as well. Um, how is it for for listeners who who aren't aware and it's a it's a difficult idea perhaps to to get our heads around how is it that misogyny and racism are all a part of this same system that you set out in down girl and entitled yeah i mean one way to think about it in the simplest possible terms is that the system is designed to privilege white cis heterosexual men um mm. and so anyone who falls outside that description whether it's because they're trans or queer or um, black or indigenous or a person of color, um, mm. you know, as well as being a girl or woman, that these are all ways in which you can be someone who's not kind of the person that the system is designed to protect. Um, and I think that also applies to class in a big way as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, somewhat complicated by the fact that you often have gendered and racial stratifications within classes. But that being said, there's certainly a class dimension that's essential to this analysis as well, where, yeah, if you fall outside those parameters of the kind of person who, you know, in a way in this, in this latest book, I'm trying to theorize the people who were held to owe too much to uh, collectively. Yeah, if you think about 
the various ways in which people who, in being, say, a woman of color, are deemed inessential or essential, but in a purely instrumental way to upholding the interests of, of white cis-set men, then you get a kind of clearer picture, I think, of of why there would be these crucial intersectional considerations around the ways in which gender and race interact to give us things like misogyny noir, which is Moya Bailey's term for um, the ways in which black women in the U.S. are subject to unique sui generis forms of mm. bigotry. Just picking up on something you said there, Kate, about class, because in Entitled, you, you, you make this kind of, and maybe this is a, uh, maybe you had this discussion with your editor of whether it's going to be a footnote or in the body of the text, but you, you briefly mentioned Me Too movement being less maybe signifying uh, something about a shift in the ground or show, social change, but more just a symptom of like late stage capitalism. Mm. So you say something like, you know, look, the, the, all these men have been called out. They're men who basically have lost earning potential now. And whereas people like Ed Westwick or Aziz Ansari, look, they've still got earning potential. So they just haven't been affected. Mm. Uh, the, I guess my question is for you, like, do you think there is a kind of oppressive nature of capitalist society and that's related to misogyny? Yeah, um, absolutely. Like, so if you thought of, um, so in Down Girl, for instance, you say, if we didn't have patriarchy, then hostility towards women wouldn't be misogyny. It'd just be hostility towards mi- women. Do you mm-hmm. think, like, analogously, if we had, like, different socioeconomic uh, structures, misogyny would also kind of disappear or be different? Yeah, I mean, that I'm not sure about. It's a really good question. I mean, I would say misogyny has existed and, and persists even in non-capitalist contexts, which I think is, is important. But certainly in the milieu that I'm, I'm mostly focusing on, like the US and Australia, my home country, and to some extent the UK as well, I think that capitalism, late stage capitalism and misogyny crucially interact. I mean, the point about the Me Too movement that I wanted to make that I think is actually really important, sort of interacts with the point about ageism that I made in the last episode and thinking about who we're comfortable labeling a rapist or, or perhaps better saying that they committed a crime of sexual assault or, or rape. And it seems like we're much more comfortable labeling the so-called uh, supposed creepy old men in those, those ways rather than admitting that you know, the younger, quote, you know, quote unquote, hotter 30 year old men like Ed Westwick, um, is, mm. I think, quite credible evidence that he has committed sexual assault. And yeah, the terrible thing is we're comfortable saying that someone who's sort of passed it, like a Bill Cosby or a Harvey Weinstein or a Roger Ailes, who, I mean, they're men who just, yeah, don't have much residual earning potential. Um, mm. especially, you know, in those latter, uh, sorry, in the case of, you know, Ailes, I think in his eighties, you know, you have comparable cases. You know, I won't bore you by listing off, but in those cases, it's, it's as if we're, we're comfortable kind of labeling these people the problem, um, mm. when the problem is much more widespread and will actually yeah. force us to, to have a real reckoning with the fact that it starts much younger, as we know from looking at people like Harvey Weinstein or for that matter, Kevin Spacey. We know that they started at least in their 30s um, Mm -hmm. for Weinstein and I think in his 20s for Spacey, and yet we kind of somehow read the older him back into the narrative and find it plausible, whereas when, yeah, 30-year-old Westwick is accused, he just seems too young and, and, yeah, hot to be a predator. Um, So it's another really pernicious rape myth that emerges from capitalist logic. One of the other central themes of the book is that of bodily control and autonomy. Uh, I think the following passage is a nice way into here, uh, so, uh, about particularly about the ab- abortion debate. Uh, and this is directly quoted from yourself. Uh, the anti-abortion movement is not plausibly about life. Uh, it's not plausibly about religion either, at least not in the sense of owing directly to Christian religious doctrines now culturally associated with the movement. I think in Down Girl, you said that moral philosophers are wrong to give the anti-abortion advocate 
at the benefit of the doubt in thinking that it is a moral matter. If the media reports are anything to go by, we'd be forgiven for thinking that there's been an increase in legislators pushing for stronger abortion laws in the United States. Uh, why should we not think that this is a matter of the sanctity of life? Uh, right wing commentators and politicians uh, often tell us that they are making moral mm -hmm. arguments about abortion. Uh, so why should we not take them on their word for that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think part of it is that these are generally Republicans who are making this argument while showing themselves to be completely unconcerned with things like health care that preserve and uphold life, unconcerned with children being detained and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, kidnapped at the border. And, you know, mm. seven, I think we're up to at least seven, uh, perhaps, forgive me, it might be eight children who have now died in, in custody um, mm -hmm. in cages. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they show themselves to be um, not terribly concerned with the quality of water in Flint, Michigan. You add up all of these, and they're also not concerned with the women who might well die seeking illegal abortions if it becomes mm -hmm. much harder to obtain a legal abortion. So I think, all told, it just becomes very implausible that um, the people who happen to be militating against abortion are, are terribly worried about life and deeply invested in its sanctity seems rather that they're really trying to stop women from exerting bodily and reproductive control and terminating mm. pregnancies. That, I think, is what it's really about. And I think philosophically we make a mistake in saying, okay, well, let's, you know, let's, let's treat this as a good faith argument. I think mm. that made sense, you know, 30 years ago. But now mm. when the crackdown on abortion is getting increasingly nasty and draconian, and all of the good philosophical arguments, you know, from people like Judy Thompson, that um, there is no entitlement to have your life sustained by another human body. Mm. Yeah, when all of those arguments have kind of fallen on deaf ears, I think it's time to rethink philosophically what our approach is and to do some debunking. So just to unpack that in a little bit more depth, and I think this really resonated with us when we read the book, we were speaking, of it, speaking about it off microphone, you say, okay, so these, these right-wing politicians and uh, evangelicals, they might say uh, that life is sacred, given by God, mm -hmm. but they've got very little time for police violence, uh, maternal mortality rates mm -hmm. amongst women, and um, little interest for children born into poverty. And a great quote from the book, you, you put it so perfectly, you say, is life sacred or not? One wonders. I think that's really powerful because you're pointing at them saying, look, you've got a contradiction within your worldview. You can't just be concerned about this thing and this only. It shows that you're prejudiced against a certain thing. But what about, I guess, the evangelical who's voting for that particular politician? They might say, well, I'm a Christian. I care about all people in need and I don't hold these Con this contradictory view. I think that children shouldn't be born into poverty. I want the government to do more. I'm mm -hmm. against police violence. And I think that abortion is morally wrong from a religious stance. So the, in, in a sense, what I'm asking is, does your argument apply to the, I know we're speaking about most people, but do you think your argument gets around the, the majority, the voting base's mm -hmm. argument? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I would say, it's you know, if I was looking Yesterday, at a survey of Republicans, you know, how many Republicans think police violence um, against black people in the U.S. is a problem? I believe it was only 20% think that. Um, mm. So, you know, just as, a, as an empirical matter, I think yeah. a lot of the base does have this contradictory worldview. However, I certainly think there's a possibility of someone who is consistent and who does have genuine um, concerns about abortion including people who've been, you know, somewhat duped by the historical nature of this movement. So something that I, I looked at in both books is the way the anti-abortion movement in the States, it's, it's not like it took a religious tenet and turned it political. It actually was a political tenet that turned religious. So it was a, what's called AstroTurf movement that, um, you know, tried to um, to get evangelicals to vote um, Republican rather than Democrat in the early 70s by drumming up this fear of abortion as well as acid and amnesty for draft dodgers. So it's like mm. part of this so-called AAA strategy for trying to yeah, create a moral panic about abortion as part of worries about the dissolution of the nuclear family, among other things. 
Mm-hmm. Um, now, that being said, you can get people who today, because of this AstroTurk movement, sincerely do have a moral conviction that abortion is morally wrong. And I would say to someone like that, look, there's lots of things I think are morally wrong, but I don't legislate against. Things mm-hmm. like, you know, cheating on one's partner. I, I'm not talking here about poly relationships. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. someone who really, if you have an understanding with your partner that you'll be sexually exclusive, then going behind their back and having sex with someone else, I think that's horribly immoral. But nonetheless, we don't have laws against that very good reason. We don't want the state legislating our bodies and our sexual activities in that way. Mm-hmm. And I would say analogously, let's say you do have this sincere moral belief that I don't share that abortion is immoral, nonetheless, might we be able to agree that legislating in a draconian way against abortion, is that the best policy choice? That is a question that would be difficult to answer in the affirmative. In the, the second half of the chapter on bodily autonomy, you, you turn your attention to trans women mm-hmm. and the way in which uh, both uh, cis men and women uh, will look to police uh, certain areas uh, that are obviously uh, quite uh, hot topics about uh, like trans issues at the moment, uh, with one being the um, bathroom bills. Uh, and uh, you also depict quite a, a graphic case of where, mm-hmm. uh, where some boys rape uh, a trans woman and and from that position of the the expectation they have for a person's genitals to to match their expectation of the gender and just on the note with with bathroom uh, bills uh, and 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 that expectation what is it do you think that is driving that policing of the trans uh, community from from cis people um is that what's the particular motivation behind that transphobia yeah no i love that question i mean I think there is, and I don't want to suggest this is, you know, the whole puzzle, but I think it's a piece of it. I think there is an extraordinary sense of entitlement on the part of people kind of attached to the bodily and gendered status quo that genitals match uh, one's expectations based on gender presentation. It, this is something I take from the work of an amazing trans philosopher, Italia May Betcher. This sense mm-hmm. of the entitlement to, um, to read genitals off appearance and to, um, to know that someone who's wearing a skirt doesn't have a penis. I find that like when, when you break it down like that, to me, it's such an invasive, intrusive and immoral assumption as well as sense of entitlement. Like why should you be entitled to know someone's genital arrangements? Mm-hmm. Um, because of the way, you know, they choose to present themselves. Like to me, that's, it's kind of none of anyone's business. And I think the extraordinarily vicious and punitive policing of trans women's bodies, which is really exemplified by trying to, which I, I think of as, it's just such a cruel thing trying to restrict restroom access to someone who, you know, just wants to use the restroom and, mm. you know, to try to, to try to restrict that is to make a class of persons unable to occupy public space in a comfortable way. Yeah, I I do think it emanates from a really potent sense of entitlement to police people's bodies in such a way that maintains the current social order where you know what's between someone's legs based on how they present and you know what their reproductive capacities are, you know what kind of Mm -hmm. sex they can give you. And I just think, why should we permit that sense of entitlement to persist Why can't we view the existence, uh, I mean, trans folks have always existed, of course, but why can't we view the visibility of trans folks as an extraordinary strike for gender liberation? Mm -hmm. In Down Girl, Kate, you say that we should define being a misogynist as uh, what you call the threshold concept and as a comparative one. And likewise, in Entitled, you say that we should think we should understand misogynists to be overachievers. And this kind of prompted in me Mm. two kind of questions. And one of these might actually not be relevant, as Andy highlighted to me before uh, the interview. So if it isn't relevant, please tell me it isn't. But the first is like, (laughs) how do the... um, the kind of let's say the qualitative and the quanti- 
quantitative aspects of misogyny interact to meet the threshold for that concept. So in other words, and you might think, how do the different types of what you say down girl moves interact with the frequency of them such that we can correctly label people misogynists, right? So you might think, you know, you have people who do, in one instance, something absolutely atrocious, right? Mm -hmm. and, and misogynistic as compared to someone who just shushes only women students in the campus library, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's the first part of the question. How do those two interact to meet the threshold? And is that even important? Uh, and the second part is like, why should, what's, why should we define being a misogynist as comparative to some specific class, right? And, um, mm -hmm. and what should those classes be? And when I say why should we, I mean like what's the benefit, what's the advantage it gives us? Because if we, we can preserve the label of being a real offender, but if, if it's comparative, but doesn't it always then give, a, give people the opportunity to say, well, look, they're not real offenders <laughs> relative to some other class. My, think, my analogy here is like how Steve Bannon now says, let them call you racist because relative mm. to a certain class, you know, he doesn't consider himself to be a racist, where relative to another class, we would consider him to be a racist, right? Yeah, that no, sense. that's it. Does it's no, it's a really good point and potential objection to the view. Um, but I must admit, I I kind of waffled somewhat on this score because one way to define things would just be to say to admit that on this definition, you could say that everyone is to some extent misogynistic, in as much as I think we all. Pretty much all of us, certainly me included, to some extent perpetuate and channel certain patriarchal norms and expectations on occasion. I think these mm. things are really entrenched, so it would be super surprising if that many people were like totally free of these biases and tendencies. The thing that tripped me up and that made me reluctant to go that direction was reflecting on the fact that misogynist is a very shaming label. Mm. Um, that's not to say that I think it's a bad uh, word to have in our lexicon. I actually think it's important, but it's the kind of word I think would either lose its power or would be very widely resistant, uh, resisted because of that shaming connotation if it was applied mm. semi-universally or universally. And so my thought was, like, what are the contexts in which I want someone to be able to use the term misogynist? And I think it makes sense to use it kind of like a warning label to label the worst offenders, people who you really should be watching out for. And as a woman, it might be important to warn other woman, women quickly and efficiently rather than listing a whole bunch of behaviors. I might, and I, I should say, like, I do this not on a routine basis. In, in fact, I can't think of a single instance where I have used this label, but nonetheless, you might have occasion as a woman or, or for that matter, as a man or non-binary person to sparingly use this label to quickly warn someone he's to be avoided, he is, mm -hmm. or for that matter, she is, is a really toxic person along the lines of gender. And that's where I kind of got this definition where I think of a misogynist as someone who's particularly and consistently misogynistic. And so then when you do the calculus, I think you should take into account both. Is it, is it particularly bad qualitatively? Like, did he, is, is he just like a little uncomfortable with women, you know, speaking up in meetings or did he label a woman a bitch and stalk out? Mm. And you mm. should also take into account how often this kind of behavior occurs. So I think of it as, yeah, as additive in that way. Uh, does that make sense? It does make sense. But I, I, can I, can I follow yeah, up with of the, then? Just the idea, is it important then that we actually be able to call people and label people misogynists other than just the kind of the shorthand warning of our, mm -hmm. you know, friends and colleagues, whatever? Or do you, do you think there's some other function that we need to really be able to clearly say these people are misogynists and if we weren't to label that them that way, you know, we'd maybe our norms against misogyny would kind of corrode away or something like this? If, if we even have that many strong norms against misogyny. Yeah, I think it's much more important to have, to have a robust way of calling out misogynistic actions, practices, institutions, mm -hmm. and social policies. And so I can see someone arguing against having a term misogynist at all. And 
you know, so you can distinguish, if you like, three views that you could extrapolate from a structural view of misogyny like mine. You could hold we're all a little bit misogynistic um, and mm. some are more misogynistic than others. Could hold a view like mine, a threshold concept where people have to reach a certain level to be labeled misogynist. Mm -hmm. But you could argue there's no such thing as a misogynist and um, there's only such a thing as misogyny. And those views would all have some benefits and some costs. And I, I think a, a significant cost of the last view would be that um, it would let some people too easily off the hook. So if you think of really... Mm obvious cases like Donald Trump, who I'm happy to label a misogynist. You know, it seems odd to have scruples about calling him a misogynist on these mm. very general grounds. I'm sort of open to persuasion on this point. Like, I I think this is a place where reasonable minds can very easily disagree on how to extrapolate the best account of what a misogynist is, or even argue for abolishing the term. What's really important is we have ways of calling out misogyny as a property of social environments. And that's mm. what I really care about. Uh, so up until this point in the interview, then, um, it's probably fair to say that much of what we've talked about is quite dark, to say the least. <laughs> yes, um, sorry so about in, that. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, uh, but in the spirit of the, the final chapter of your book entitled, um, c can you envision a future where the privileged position of men is condensed and that women and girls across all intersections, be it the trans community, uh, people of colour uh, and non-binary people, uh, get the, the unashamedly have the the entitlement to all of the things uh, that men perhaps take very much for granted. Oh, I really hope so. I mean, it's certainly something I thought a lot about when you know I wrote a lot of this book while while pregnant with my my baby girl, and subsequently, you know, um, uh, joking in the you know little intermission that actually submitted the book from the labor and delivery room. Um, so you know, I really wrote this book with a sense of my daughter and her generation's future uh, in mind. And I don't exactly label myself optimistic or hopeful, but I do think the future is, well, the future has yet to be written. And we can do a lot to change some of the worst forms of male entitlement, partly by you know, thinking carefully about the way we raise our boys and also thinking about the way we raise our girls thinking about ways in which we can help them to feel genuinely entitled to goods that everyone is entitled to, things like, you know, the the ability to control one's own body, um, mm. you know, to feel pleasure, to seek help for pain, stuff that's so ethically basic. Um, but I, I do, put it this way, I do feel deeply committed to fighting for a world that I don't think there's any you know, fatalistic sense in which it always has to be deeply problematic along these lines. Mm. We've had Stephen Pinker, the psychologist on the show, a couple of times now, Kate. Um, mm. And as you know, he makes the case that sexual violence and domestic violence are on the decline, especially in, in the Western world that we're kind of talking about with America and, and US and Australia. Um, would you agree with his analysis in the long run we're kind of winning this fight against misogyny? I think a lot of the... Um... The data on this score is often really hard to analyze. It, we often lack mm. really good numbers because these are crimes that are notoriously massively underreported and mm. we don't always know exactly what factors contributing to how much they're being reported. I, I'm really, I have to say I find Pinker's questions, you know, is violence getting better or worse? I find them a bit odd. Mm -hmm. What I'm most interested in, given that progress is never inevitable and we have to keep fighting for it and it's always hard won, what I'm interested in is how are things now um, mm -hmm. at this particular moment in time. And, you know, there I think we do face a situation where we have still egregious injustices to solve. Um, and it's, it's to me really cold comfort if, you know, my chance of being bonked on the head and um, and dying are, is less than a 13th century peasant. Um. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Well, one thing you and Steve do have in common is you're both interested in the idea of moral progress mm -hmm. and you're both trying to reconcile your secular views in the absence of God. So True. do you have any 
uh, views on this at, at the moment. So you've, you've a lot of your work I know focuses on meta ethics and moral imperatives. Yeah, Do you you pose this in Down Girl and in Entitled as a moral fight. Do you have any idea of how, uh, from the secular point of view, we can call this progress "quote unquote" good? Mm. Yeah, they, it's a great question. I mean, I think of the nature of morality without God as like a deep, super interesting question, and that's one of the kind of animating questions for me. As you mm. just as you point out in meta ethics, I mean, who if not God can tell you what to do? And my actual answer to this in meta ethics is relatively simple: it's other people and creatures tell you via their bodies what to do and not to do to them. Um, So, you know, I think of pain as a kind of imperatival state, Mm -hmm. or at least it's closely associated with a kind of bodily imperative, a kind of make it stop state. And this is, Mm -hmm. you know, riffing from work by philosophers of mine like Colin Klein and others who've, who've theorized pain in this way. But if you think about that bodily imperative as not just having moral significance, but actually Mm. being um, itself, not just a bodily, but a moral imperative that really is telling other people, don't inflict this pain. Do help Mm. me if I'm hurting. Get me the water I'm thirsty for. Um, Mm. You know, give me relief. And also don't torture me because a lot of bodily imperatives, so we can tell what they are at their most fundamental because they're what torturers use. To break people. Mm. So if you think of like the individual bodies and minds of people and creatures as issuing moral imperatives to all of us to abide by them, to help, not mm. to harm, you know, there remain really difficult questions about how to add things up and how to adjudicate competing claims and all sorts of, of really tricky stuff. But mm. there's a relatively clear way, even in the absence of one univocal moral voice, you have all these little vulnerable and easy to ignore voices um, yeah. on the part of vulnerable people and creatures. And the less you're making people and creatures cry out in pain, the better things are getting. Put it really simplistically, that the less rape you have, the better things are getting. Right. Okay, good. That, that's really, really interesting because we come off the back of these two books and we think, right, what shall we do? Like, how can we ground this? Mm. If we're from the, I think philosophers who read this, how can we ground this morally speaking? And for the everyday person, what do I need to do? So I wonder just to, to push you on this, I'm really interested to hear your view as to the normative side then. So do you have a, like a, a to put it crudely, like a, a preference on normative ethical view or do you have are we supposed to build a new ethical view off the back of this and say, well, we should respect all people's rights to their entitlement and one being should never encroach on the entitlement of another being? And Do you see what I mean? How's it yeah, going to yeah. play out if we try and devise a moral system off the uh, the kind of things you speak about in the book? So, I, I mean, I have a meta ethics, but not a preferred normative ethical view because what mm. emerges from like a meta-ethical view like mine is there would be numerous ways to go on to regulate what one ought to do, all things considered, given that you'll have sources of claims coming from every single person and creature who is a subject, who has something like bodily imperatives. And what you, Mm. the end result of that will be a kind of mess of, well, what's the first order normative um, theoretical answer to what you should do when there's a whole world of people and creatures who kind of could use your help. That I think is a kind of, that's a question above my pay grade as someone who teaches, but doesn't really do normative theory. I think yeah. often, I mean, I'm somewhat inclined to both a particularist kind of multivocal answer to that question where there are lots mm. and lots of good things you can do as well as lots and lots of bad things you can do. You know, there are lots, of ways in which you might be able to work towards making the world less oppressive and one where there's less of this thing we call rape culture and one in which people are able to seek justice. And Mm. I feel attracted to a kind of pluralist position, one way of articulating roughly what that pluralist position and particularist position would ask you is for each person, like, what can you do? We have a rough idea and I think a sufficiently firm idea of what a better world along these lines would look like, um, you know, along lines of 
gender, but also racial, class, um, mm. you know, trans, queer, justice. What what would a, a more inclusive and fair world look like along all of those dimensions? And then right. what can you do to make that happen? And yeah, it'll be partly about respecting people's entitlements, partly about fulfilling their obligations. Yeah, it will also be about looking for opportunities to do this necessary, brutal, piecemeal work of trying mm. to chip away at the status quo and make things better in a progressive and egalitarian direction. Um, so the last question for this section before we go on to listener questions. And um, so at the start of entitlement, Kate, you say that some of the cases in the book are going to be instances of male entitlement, and some of the cases are ones where women are deprived of a certain good. And you say that these are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, what does what is the relationship between the two? Right. So what is the relationship between the entitlement of one group of people and the lack of entitlement for another group of people? Is it just depend upon how the kind of goods that we want, we, sh we think lots of people should be entitled to, are initially coded for gender in the first place? Or are there like other stronger causal connections there maybe? So um, the reason I thought this, or uh, uh, thought to ask you the question is, that some of the cases seem to be different. So for instance, the entitlement to consent or sex seems to be very different to me at least as the the entitlement to having one's pain and reports of pain mm -hmm. taken seriously because mm -hmm. one of those entitlements always will infringe on the autonomy of mm -hmm. another person and therefore will co directly causally harm them the other entitle entitlement i guess both groups could be entitled to that so there seems like different yeah. types of t entitlement and one of them is obviously way more pernicious than the other yeah totally i mean i think it's crucial to recognize that there's a distinction between supposed entitlement where they're in fact bogus so things like an entitlement to sex consent um, mm. and admiration but there are also entitlements that are genuine and morally licit. Um, so, you know, the idea that men are deemed entitled to adequate health care, uh, that reflects the genuine uh, moral fact that men are entitled to health care. Mm. It's just that in that case, I think women are often deprived along with, with some men, of course, as well. But women are, are disproportionately deprived of that which mm -hmm. everyone is genuinely entitled to in the form of having pain and bodily suffering and mental illness and such taken seriously. And so, yeah, I think it's really important in the book to see that I'm often navigating between areas where, um, you know, at the most extreme end, no one is entitled to sex, fairly obviously, I think. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of it, everyone is entitled to good health care. And what you have in all of these cases is a differential, you know, um, uh, a gender differential where men are being enti deemed entitled more often than women when you take into account other intersecting social factors. So women are being deemed less entitled than their male counterparts. But that um, leaves untouched and is orthogonal to the issue of whether and how often those underlying entitlements are genuine when it comes to anyone of any gender. Thank you to everybody who submitted a listener question for Kate. If you have a listener question for one of our future guests, you can find further information on our website. A link's in the description. Uh, we've all picked one question each out of all the questions submitted. If you want to kick us off, Dr. Miller. Uh, this is from Alex Dyke in the USA. And they say, does Dr. Mann have a particular audience in mind when she writes her books? I found Down Girl to be really dense open brackets i'm not complaining please don't be insulted kate man i love your work Close brackets. <laughs> compared to other works of modern, modern feminist theory that i've read it was quite hard recently she said that entitled was written more plainly and i was wondering if she could expand on what that entailed and how she found the process was different to the process of writing down girl yes great question uh not insulted at all and <laughs> Uh, kind of words. Um, I definitely wrote the books with very different audiences in mind. Um, 
down girl I wrote as an assistant professor who was um, coming up for tenure in a few years. And so it's mm. partly and in some ways primarily an academic book. I mean, it was written as a, a so-called crossover book that was also meant to be of interest to a general audience. But that wasn't the primary audience I had in mind. It is, however, my favorite audience to write for. I love writing for an audience beyond uh, philosophers, although mm. I hope philosophers are interested in what I have to say. My favorite audience to write for is anyone interested in, in reading about these issues um, and who's willing to uh, think, you know, entertain a little bit of philosophical background and whatnot. Mm. And so when I wrote Entitled, it's a very different kind of book. It's a trade book. And so it's really intended for anyone who doesn't mind the occasional uh, reference to things like, you know, epistemic injustice in Miranda Fricker's term or testimonial silencing in Christy Dodson's term that I then very clearly go on to explain and give examples of. And a lot of it is written in a pretty journalistic way, I think, I hope. Uh, that was at least my aim when I was writing it. So different kind of press, different editors, and yeah, very different kind of writing process where I was trying for a much more essayistic style and entitled, hoping to reach a kind of as wide an audience as I could. Uh, our next question is from Matthias, who's from Hungary. He says, uh, I suppose male privilege is deeply rooted in our culture. What can we do to change that on a bigger level? So he's put brackets here. So not only educating individuals to make correct decisions, and would that solution also work for his other issues such as racism? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, again, you know, I hope this doesn't seem like a cop out, that it has to be quite piecemeal. Like there are mm. one thing I'm trying to do in this latest book is show how many areas of life uh, male privilege and entitlement are kind of embedded in. So it's both entrenched, as, as Matthias uh, rightly pointed out, it's also incredibly widespread and prevalent, working to make the healthcare system more just, to make sex something that is more ethical and that we're more educated about, working to make uh, the justice system take rape seriously without being more draconian in a way that's wrong in, in and of itself and, of course, horribly racist working to make power available to people of different genders, working to make knowledge something that is not uh, masculine coded in relevant mm. domains. Like it, it is so many pieces of it, I think kind of get stuck in where you can. And there's going to be just a plethora of policies, institutions and practices that will need to combat this. There'll be you no know, sort of one structural thing we can do. Uh, next question is from Sarah in Syria, uh, who says, Hi, Kate, big fan of your work. My question is about your approach to intersectionality. I'm curious why you seem to empower women who symbolize success for other women in the US, but who participate in or actively support harmful policies for women outside the US. Yeah, no, thanks, Sarah. I mean, I think that's a very tricky issue. One thing I'm often really trying to do in my work is, you know, call out problematic social structures and behaviors without heaping blame on individuals who participate in problematic practices. And I think there's this thing that I call a uh, tyranny of vulnerability, which I think of as a real problem when it comes to female politicians who often are complicit in, you know, ways that are, you know, of real, uh, you know, are significantly impacting the lives of people, for example, in the global south in detrimental ways. Um, but so are their male counterparts. And I think I tend to be more keen to call out the structures rather than individuals who participate them in those instances, because mm. once we start to single out individuals, it's usually the women who get more blame than their male counterparts for engaging in behaviors that no U.S. politician should be complicit in. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the general modus operandi. It's also influenced decisions of mine. Like, I don't call out individual women on Twitter. I just don't. Mm -hmm. I rarely call out individual men either. But I try to draw attention to the structures and mm -hmm. the statistics and the facts and the practices that are bad. But I think there's such a danger that when you call out women, even when they're doing real harm to other women, you feed into a misogynistic moralism against them. And the whole system is just much bigger and deeper and more complex than that. The way I've chosen to fight it myself is to try to call out the structure 
Our final listener question comes from Jim Clare in the USA. Jim wants to know what you think of Camille Paglia's observations on masculinity. And as a follow-up, for America or anywhere else for that matter, what should an ideal of masculinity look like now? Yeah, I don't think much of Camille Paglia, to be totally honest. And so I can't say I've like poured over her work in in Mm. huge detail. I tend to try to focus on feminists are in her case so-called feminists who I'm more inspired by however you know I'm a big fan of non-toxic masculinity um Mm -hmm. you know some people think masculinity should just be abolished I think that's kind of unrealistic I think you know given what a entrenched thing masculinity is why not make it something positive and you know and as I said non-toxic gentle non-violent and perhaps most importantly compatible with and even something that's designed to further caregiving so Mm -hmm. something i I think i might write about someday is good exemplars moral exemplars of men who are uh, actively caring um Mm -hmm. not just by looking after their own progeny which is you know a good start but a is still kind of conforming to the patriarchal you know thought that your own offspring are um, the Mm -hmm. priority but B is often too exaggerated as well. We found like I found lots of evidence from writing my book that unfortunately men still do only about half the caregiving work women do. But what mm-hmm. about thinking about like the man in my neighborhood, Ithaca, who uh, looks after injured squirrels and raccoons, um, who no one wants mm-hmm. to like, you know, who, who no one really has uh, any time for. And, you know, mm-hmm. these animals would otherwise just be put down. So what about thinking about masculinity that takes certain of its tenets and takes virtues like strength and whatnot and retools them to be more oriented Mm. to caregiving that's that's something i I think is really worth exploring yeah definitely that sounds fascinating if um we've we mentioned earlier we had uh, christian miller on talk about milgram and psychology and and how we can be better more virtuous people and he says it's two ways which we might well one to a couple of ways out of many which we could try and make ourselves more virtuous one is getting the word out and i think your book does a great job of Mm -hmm. showing us what we do and in light of that information you know if we know that it's misogynistic when a partner trying to guilt their other partner into mm-hmm. sex, for example, that's an act of misogyny. They might be inclined to do it less. And I love this idea of doing moral exemplars and of male characters as well, because role models can really impact that. So I think that's a, that's a fascinating idea. Yeah, thanks. We, and I love Christian's work. I think it's really important. We, we love it as well. We're all, in, we're all in agreement here. And I think <laughs> we'll be in agreement a bit more in our concluding remarks. Mr. Ollie Marley, would you like to kick us off with your concluding remarks? Sure. So just want to say, Kate, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today uh, about Entitled, um, which is your brand new book, and, and Down Girl. Um, I first read Down Girl, I think, last year. Um, I read it quite quick, and a lot of it actually went, over my head quite a lot (laughs) but reading entitled and then going back to down girl um i've really uh, engaged with the the topics that you've you've written about and really really stewed over them and thought about them in depth and it's led to some fascinating discussions with with friends family and and anyone on the street really that is willing to listen to me um i think a really popular (laughs) criticism of philosophy is that it's just a bunch of old boring men (laughs) sat in their armchairs theorizing about things that aren't really that important to the modern day or people in general and i think that you're you're a brilliant example of a philosopher that is is diverse that is concerned with the present day um concerned with intersectionality and that you're you're writing about a topic that is so important um, and so complex to understand in in the modern context Um, and you write in such an articulate uh, stark in a good way uh, simple and simple to understand way and i think that you're probably one of the best examples of a uh, a modern facing feminism that kind of really communicates these ideas clearly mm. and i'm really on board with your ideas and please write loads more books because i'll i'll read them all so oh. thank you very much <laughs> wow thank you that means so much blushing is so great <laughs> You'll you'll be red as a tomato by the end of it, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Andrew Horton. Yeah, I, I would just uh, reiterate exactly uh, what Ollie's uh, the sentiment there. Thank you so much for for joining us today. Uh, it's it's always a great opportunity to to just get a little bit beyond the book and and get your thoughts on uh, particularly your th- uh, thoughts on meta ethics uh, makes me want to go and read some of the the other stuff that you've you've written on that topic. 
as far as uh, my my relationship with with the the two texts that we've we've talked about, it really made me think a lot more carefully about the subtle psychology of a lot of the uh, behavior. I think when as somebody who teaches a lot of stuff about normative ethics, um, you can kind of prescribe certain things to say, oh, you should do that or you, or you shouldn't do this. Um, but it, your books highlight so much more uh, importantly of the underlying uh, Im- like implicit biases that people will have and and how that holds certain structures together mm. and the more i thought about it it just made me think about the way i i perhaps will think about ethics uh, and and that sort of thing in the future quite a bit so i i took quite a lot from that I also uh, appreciate just how much uh, work of other other scholars that you've obviously spent a lot of time discussing in your two texts, um, and it, that has also inspired me to want to go and read some of their work um, because I mean there's so many people out there that I've yet to read, and I would say for anybody who hasn't read either Downgall or or Entitled, is that you'll be uh, introduced to a lot of thinkers. And obviously, as we've uh, uh, Ollie touched upon there, is, is that obviously we're, we're very much getting away from just simply talking about uh, white male philosophers that yeah. we we know as a show we've been guilty of doing mm. a, an awful lot. Uh, so I'd heavily encourage everybody to to read your books, and and if they haven't got a background in feminist theory, that uh, that they should uh, dig deeper. And then finally, just on entitled itself, I thought it just it was so concise and got to the point. Uh, so effectively on certain chapters and just argued it so brilliantly uh, that I, I definitely would recommend it to anybody who who wants a really solid introduction because it just touches upon all of the most important issues facing uh, women and and also obviously what what any man can reflect on about their own behavior um so just again yeah thank you oh, very much for, thank for you. the efforts you put in thank you so much that means so much to me even redder now <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for speaking to us, Kate. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I really enjoyed reading Entitled. As I said earlier, be- you know, before everyone else got to read it, so that was a real pleasure. Um, and I was trying to think about when did I read Down Girl? And I realized earlier that it was the first, it was the first piece of philosophy that I'd read after I submitted, uh, my thesis, which is, I guess, the first piece of philosophy you're allowed to read you're allowed to read that isn't, you know, con- forced upon, you're constrained. And it was kind of liberating. It was so like, I really, I remember reading this and going, oh, this is what philosophy can be like again, right? This is, I feel free from like, just uh, uh, like you, when you can read whatever you want to read in a way, and then you read something good, it was such a nice feeling, even though the topics in the book are so upsetting. But it was just, I really, I really appreciated that about the book. And part of me thought, why did I, why did I like that about it? And I think it's just because from the outset, it was just really focused. It was just down the barrel and here's an issue. Here's a really clear ex- statement of this issue. Here's a really clear analysis of it. And not only I'll give you, give you a statement and analysis, here it is in action and here are mm. just tons of examples. And I think again, that's what entitlement did too. And what will I go away and think about? I don't know if you've ever thought about it, Kate, but there's this phenomenon that is, hey, look, there are these awful things that happen to people, and now they, we give them these names that have helped helped people conceptualize them. Hympathy, Horasia, uh, and the one that my wife has told me about recently is Himjury, you know, when men, <laughs> when men moan about their pain more, right? Mm-hmm. And it just is just, and in, you use the example in Entitled a few times when you say, people have been described as being handsy and you said that's such a fitting description uh, and it's like, suggestive of a certain sort of wisdom and i kind mm. of think oh what is the phenomenon there of there being an implicit form of knowledge that gets labeled and then it was we can have this ameliorative sort of concept going forward and we can use that to make progress and i think that is what your work has done to make me realize at least is that is a kind of a quite a big phenomenon and it's given me lots of good examples of that to go away and think about so thank you very much thank you i'd like to thank you as well kate uh particularly i want to echo ollie's andy's and greg's uh, comments as well i agree with everything they've said there and on behalf of all of our listeners as well we've been hoping to get you on the show since since down girl came out and it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you we've we're really looking forward to it and it, it certainly didn't disappoint entitled uh i think it's it's one of the best books uh, that we've read across all of these 80 or so episodes it's one of the 
my, my favorite texts we've got to read as part of the project. And maybe in terms of like my day to day life and how I see interactions, uh, particularly in between men and women, it might be one of the most important texts uh, that I'll ever read, never mind in just in terms of this project. I think when I was reading through the book, I found myself speaking to some men about uh, some of these um, issues. And it's amazing how quickly they revert to the kind of logical fallacies and the kind of you know, mistakes in thinking that usually ensue and how uncomfortable of a topic it is for so many people. But at the same time, I found myself being inspired to have more conversations uh, with the women around me about some of these topics. And uh, for example, my uh, my mum's a mental health specialist midwife. My youngest sister's works with people who have been sexually assaulted and supports them in court and and my oldest is a psychologist. And when I spoke to them about the arguments and the types of things like empathy and domestic abuse and even epistemic entitlement in the book, when I spoke to them about your ideas, they were like, yes, like we literally face this every single day. And I think this is a book which really speaks to truth. It will really resonate with women around the world. And I think men can learn a hell of a lot from this book. So, and it's accessible as well, which we should really emphasize that I think anyone above the age of 16 could read this text and, and really get a thorough understanding of, of how, miso- what misogyny looks like in the world. So if you've enjoyed the podcast, then you have to buy this book. A link's in the iTunes description. Uh, but at risk of ruining your enjoyment of <laughs> well, the podcast. Yeah, let me just say thank you so much. I, I just, I, I think a lot of these topics, you know, I so appreciate what you said because they're controversial. And more mm. than anything, I just want a conversation. Or like, even if I'm wrong about a lot of things, which is totally possible, I just, I love the idea. And it means so much to me to think of people having more in depth, richer conversations using some of these ideas. Just as I've benefited so much from feminist philosophy and, you know, feminist sociology help me have conversations that I otherwise would have hesitated to have, you know, the, the ultimate compliment. Well, something you might not be as, uh, yes. as, as, as happy to, <laughs> to partake in um, is Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. Okay. So we're going to have quotes from, well, we're playing Kate Mann. Kate Mann. <laughs> it's, it's a name which, nice. that, do you, have you, are you aware of this segment yeah. already, Kate? You, you, so, do you mind me asking um, which one you've heard before, just out of interest? I heard the for... Dave Chalman uh, pop quiz ah. involving Chandler Bing. Oh, Chandler Bing. <laughs> that wasn't a, oh, that was Don't really bad. David Jack. Chandler's. <laughs> so they, well, Very there's good. a much better one this time round, but uh, I should say no promises. We're playing Kate Winslet. So first of all, we've got the Academy Emmy and Grammy award winning English actress Kate Winslet, best known for her roles in Titanic, The Holiday and Flushed Away. In the man corner, we've got the American <laughs> actor, comedian, screenwriter and producer, best known for his roles as Mike and Friends and Abel from Cain and Abel fame in the hip blockbuster <laughs> year one, the ant man himself, Paul Rudd. <laughs> And then we've got quotes from Kate Mann, associate professor of philosophy at Cornell. Yeah, we got it. That was Paul Rudd, Greg. Sorry, just, just quickly before we start, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Say Kate, that Kate Winslet's won a Grammy. Won a Grammy. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? Oh, That's the, like music. Yeah. yeah. Grammy yeah, music. She, she, she won. Is Kate, can we, can Kate Winslet? Uh, Surely not. not. Um, are you calling me <laughs> <on> that? <laughs> That's yeah, really well, very serious quiz. Yeah, you know what? I'm not even going to Google it. I'm going to double down. I'm going to say that Kate Winslet won an Academy, an Emmy, and a Grammy Award. And if I'm not right, then... Okay. We'll check that later. I quit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your first quotation. Fastest finger, just say Kate Man or Kate Man. A woman's heart is an ocean of secrets. Oh, Kate Winslet. Kate. That's Kate Winslet. Well done, Andy. It was the ship of dreams to everyone Kate else. Winslet. <laughs> Kate Winslet. Kate well, Winslet. I'm a big Titanic fan. <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> Kill all men. Ant-Man. Uh, Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Ant-Man, no. It's not the full quote. Not me. <laughs> it's Ollie? I, I, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> well, it's Kate Man. No one gets the point. It's kill all men. Just kidding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I wish I liked anything as much as my kids love bubbles. Ant Man. That's Ant Man. Yeah, yeah. Darling. I think there's something great and generic about goldfish. They're everybody's favourite pet. Ant. 
Um, and man, that's Kate's yeah. beat you there. It's two, one, one. Greg, no points on the board just yet. Basically, all my work is about moral authority in a Kate godless man. world. <laughs> Ant Man. <laughs> Some of my favourite shows include Bojack Horseman, Glow, Orange Is the New Black, and Black Mirror. Kate it's not Kate Winslet. Kate oh. Man. It's Kate Man. Well done, Greg. Did I say that? Did I admit you that did. in public? Oh my yeah, I think it was, uh, don't we think, what it's like to be a philosopher interview. Oh, right? oh, I mentally blanked that out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great interview, but great. I never remember what it <laughs> This is going to sound really weird, but I never had a desire to become famous. Paul Rudd or it, Ant-Man? <laughs> it's not Ant-Man. Kate Winslet. It's Kate Winslet. So it's three, one, one, two. And we'll have a couple more here. I like to rock and roll all night and part of every day, but I usually have errands. I can only rock from one till three. Well done, Ollie. (laughs) And finally, there were herds of kangaroos that grazed in our paddocks. I loved them and had hopes of befriending one. It never happened, sadly. I'll go Kate Man. <laughs> That's very, very well Guilty. done. That is Kate Man. <laughs> Andrew, you won the day there. A very special thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and Westhill Endowment for co-parenting the show, as well as all of our amazing patrons that make the show possible for the rest of you entitled bunch. We want to say a very special thank you to David Ligeness, Lily Hooper, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson, Maron van der Kolk, Adam Cool, and Jim Clare. To everybody involved in supporting the show, an absolutely massive thank you. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to keep bringing you your weekly dosage of the show. As a special thank you, patrons are rewarded with bonus content, including early access to upcoming episodes, including next week's episode, in which the old school pan sidecast returns in our exploration of the Eastern philosophy of Taoism. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. A link is in the iTunes description. If you'd prefer wow. not to support the show, but retain your own privilege, then we highly recommend picking up a copy of Kate Mann's brilliant <laughs> new book entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women. It might well be one of, if not the, best book that we read for the show this year. Accessible, engaging and deeply illuminating. This is a must read for everybody. You can find a link to Entitled in the iTunes description. And don't forget... We're also giving away several copies of the book, so head over to our socials to be in with a chance of winning. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Mr. Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Associate Professor of Philosophy, Kate Mann. Thank you so much. I loved your questions. And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Uh, such a sweet, fun, amazing question. I'm so honoured by the engagement. We're, we're not recording now, so you can be honest now. No, <laughs> it's all, yeah. all true. It's all completely true. No, it was so much fun.